Bismillah, alhamdulillah, you're watching Way of the Muslim, Divining the Muslim Character. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, I would like to present something that I found very interesting in Islam. It's about the way we treat each other. It's the treatment for adults and children, orphans, the poor, the elderly, etc. This is being taken from the teachings of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Let me share with you what his wife said about him. Aisha, radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her, says that she never felt so jealous of any woman as she did of Khadija. Now Khadija was the Prophet's first wife and then she had passed away. So then after that he married Aisha. So Aisha is saying, I never felt so jealous of any woman as much as I felt jealous of her though she had died three years before the Prophet married me. And that was because I heard him mention her so often and because his Lord had ordered him to give her the glad tidings that she would have a palace in paradise made of kasab and because he used to slaughter a sheep and distribute its meat among her friends. This shows a good kind of jealousy, by the way. It's the kind of jealousy that you can have when somebody has done some really good deeds, as we've mentioned in other programs, to have this kind of envy is not really bad because we should all envy to do good deeds and hope that we also would be promised the paradise. Now, the Prophet also said, I and the person who look after the orphan and provides for him will be in paradise like this. And he put up his index and middle finger together. And it, what he means by that is, whoever's taking care of the orphans is going to be with me in paradise like this. You know, this comes at a time, 1400 years ago, when people did not take care of orphans. They were very bad against the orphans. If a child was an orphan and had wealth, many times what they would do is try to figure a way to sneak it away from them. The Quran is dealing with this subject uh, throughout, talking about not stealing the wealth of these orphan children. The Prophet Wasallam, peace be upon him, also said, the one who looks after and works for a widow for, or for a poor person is like a warrior fighting in the cause of Allah or like a person who fasts during the day and prays all night long. And this is on the authority of Abu Huraira, by the way. It says that, again, I'm going to repeat it, the one who's looking after and works for a widow. This means that you're taking care of her. You're actually working to take care of her yard or take care of her house or take her where she needs to go to help her out. And for a poor person, a lot of times the poor, they, they can't do for themselves. That's why they're poor. So here we find that, that the one who is taking care of them is like fighting as a warrior in the cause of Allah or like a person who fasts during the day and then prays all night long. It means here that they're going to get high rewards. Fasting, of course, in Islam gets a person very, very high rewards. And praying all night long is also something that gets your prayers answered by Allah. It puts you in good shape with Allah. So these are the treatments that we're talking about. The poor, we're talking about those who are orphans, the widows. All of these are dealt with in Islam in a very beautiful way. Showing this mercy, showing this kindness and generosity to them. But that's not where it stops actually. There's more, because Islam dealt with more than human rights. Islam dealt with animal rights. A lot of people don't know that. 1,400 years ago, that it was Islam that really brought about this subject of animal rights. I want to mention to you one of the Hadith teachings of Muhammad, on the authority of Abu Huraira, who says that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, While a man was walking down the road, he became very thirsty. When he came to a well, he went down in the well, he got a drink from it, and he came out. Meanwhile, he saw a dog panting and licking the mud because of his excessive thirst. And the man said to himself, This dog is suffering, 
from the same state of thirst that I was in. So the man went back down the well again. He filled his shoe with water and he held it in his mouth and brought it out and then he watered the dog. And Allah thanked him for this deed and forgave him. And the people asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, O Messenger of Allah, is there a reward for us in taking care of animals? And he said, yes, there is a reward for serving any living being. What a beautiful teaching. The first time I heard it, I said, a man was forgiven and had mercy shown on him just because of this act. But then when I had it explained to me, they said, you know, in those days, to get a drink of water from a well was not that you just dropped a bucket down in there and pulled it up and take a drink. The people who used to be in the desert and they have a well out there and it has like, you know, stones around it and things and then you have to crawl down in that well. It's very dangerous actually in some cases. You go down, down, down in this well and there could be scorpions, there could be snakes and then you get the water and you're trying to bring it back up. Now, normally a person could quench their thirst in the well, just get a drink and go back out. But to water the dog, obviously he can't carry the dog on his back and take it down there. So here he's taking his shoe and filling the shoe up with water and holding it in his teeth, you know. And then here he's coming up trying to get this water for the dog. And because of this effort, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, is forgiving him. Forgiving him, letting this man go into paradise over this act. And the people were astonished, and that's why they were saying, you mean to tell me that I get a reward for taking care of animals? And then here the prophet is confirming it. There is reward for taking care of or serving any living being. MashaAllah. This, this is a beautiful mercy. By the way, I'm reminded of another hadith, a teaching where the prophet Islam mentioned a prostitute. Now, and I don't know if you thought about this. In Islam, prostitution is really bad. She can be severely punished here in this life and in the next life. Yet, a prostitute went down into a well to get a drink of water. And when she came out, she also observed an animal who was dying of thirst. She also went back down in the well in the same way, and she brought out a drink for this animal. And when it drank from there and was nourished, then Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has so much mercy you know what? He forgave this lady and let her go to Jannah. The scholars mentioned, by the way, that this lady had to have made tawbah or repented and not do those things anymore. It's not a license for you to continue in sin. You can't say, oh, well, I'll take care of some dogs and keep on sinning. No, that doesn't work like that. But certainly in Islam, we see something very beautiful here, that taking care of these animals is something that will get you forgiven in, on the Day of Judgment. It's not permissible in Islam, by the way, to do something that I've seen some children do sometimes to torture animals for fun, like pulling the wings off of a butterfly or to, you know, tie cans to a dog's tail. And then when he runs, the cans make noise and scare him and he keeps running faster and faster. A lot of children think that's fun, that's a good sport. But actually in Islam, this is something forbidden. It's not permissible to injure these animals and it's highly encouraged actually mandated for us to care for them, especially if they're in your charge. Because in another incident, it happened that there was a woman who was worshiping Allah so much in some ways, but then being very bad in others. And how that came about was, this lady had a cat. Now, she's praying in the day and fasting, etc. But then she has this cat. And she keeps it tied. She doesn't allow it to go out and get any kind of food or chase mice or creatures of any kind. So as a result, the cat died of starvation. It was totally neglected. Now, what happened in this case was that Allah did not accept this lady's worship because she did not take care of this animal. She was so cruel to this animal. So when you have cruelty inside of you like this, it will negate your worship. So this is something that we need to work on in our character to remove cruelty to animals or cruelty to any living being is not acceptable in Islam. This is something that we have to avoid at all costs. 
By the way, we find now in the states, when you go to the states, you'll find that there are laws that prohibit people from doing this very type of thing. So we have people that have animal rights laws, and they're very strong on this thing. They think they're coming up with something new, new to introduce these bills into Congress to have laws to protect these little creatures, the cats and dogs, etc., that when they're uh, needing this kind of uh, mercy, here they're trying to make laws for it, not knowing that Islam has already brought for them these laws 1,400 years ago. Isn't that amazing how Islam is providing for all times and all places and all beings? I was going to say like all people, but how about all beings because it's also providing for all the creatures of Allah. Allah made the earth subservient to the human being. We as human beings have a responsibility for that. We have to take care of everything. But did you know that also the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught us about the care of animals and plants? Not just the animals, but also plants. These are also living creatures. So much so that when there's a battle or a war going on, the Muslims are forbidden to injure plant life. Do you imagine this? To be sensitive to plant life, to not to hurt the animals or the innocent people, but plant life. And this is a part of the teaching of Islam. And by the way, this is 1,400 years before the Geneva Convention talking about the rules of war. Islam, alhamdulillah, provides us with a lot. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, is our example for this. And we know that by adhering to these characteristics in ourselves, this will develop us as better characters and give us a better status and citizenship here in this life and then also in the next life. Here's another one that uh, the Prophet ﷺ uh, stood up in the prayer. And, and he says, we too, this is Abu Huraira, by the way, telling us. He said, we too stood up along with him. And then a desert Arab, it's called a Bedouin, shouted, while offering his prayer, he shouted out, O oh Allah, give mercy to me and mercy to Muhammad only and don't give mercy to anybody else along with us. <laughs> the Prophet had finished his prayer and he said, Salaam Alaikum, Salaam Alaikum. And he said to this Bedouin man, you have really made narrow, limited, a very vast thing. And he's talking about Allah's mercy. A lot of people don't realize how much mercy Allah really has. And so they might think something like that. Well, I want all of Allah's mercy for me because I really need it. But you don't realize the vastness, the ocean of mercy that Allah has. So you don't want to restrict that. You don't want to limit it. You want to make it wide and open. So make dua or pray that all of the people will get this mercy too. Because there's no end to Allah's mercy. We're going to take a break and we want to come back and continue talking about this mercy of Allah and the treatment of others. Stay tuned. We've got more coming up right here. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, we're back. You're watching Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. We've been talking about the vastness of Allah's mercy. And I wanted to pick up right where we left off and continue about that. And we're basing what we're saying on the teachings of Muhammad, the last and final messenger of Almighty God, Allah, and something that he said about Allah's mercy. At one point, he asked his companions about a woman who was nursing a child, and he said... Would this woman throw her baby in the fire? They said, no way. No, a, a woman wouldn't, <laughs> with a newborn baby is not going to throw it in the fire. He said, the mercy that the mothers have for their children. And he's talking about all of the mothers for all the children. The mercy that we have in this life. 
is only one part of Allah's mercy. So Allah is putting this mercy in the hearts of the people, in the mothers. And this is only one part, he said. And Allah has a hundred parts of mercy. So all the mercy in all of the whole universe since the beginning of the time until the end of time is only one part of Allah's mercy. He has 99 more parts. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the other 99 parts of that mercy of Allah are waiting for the believers on the Day of Judgment. So how about this? How is the condition of the believer on the Day of Judgment? All of us make mistakes. By the way, I have too many mistakes. I hope nobody knows all of the mistakes that I've made. But I ask Allah every day to forgive me for my mistakes, things that I've done wrong. But I look forward to this mercy, this Rahmah of Allah. And while we're on that subject of His mercy, we have to realize that we too have to show mercy because as the Prophet ﷺ said, and we mentioned this, that whoever doesn't show mercy, meaning for the creation of Allah, for the people, for the animals, and so on, like we mentioned, then he won't be shown any mercy. So this is really important, to be merciful. He also said, by the way, whoever doesn't thank the people doesn't thank Allah. So we have to be thankful, we have to be merciful. And this is a way to develop a side of the character of a human being to make them more humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and more humble in front of each other and in front of all the creation of Allah as well. So let's move to this one and see what the Prophet, peace be upon him, said here. He says, you see the believers as regards their being merciful among themselves and showing love among themselves and being kind, resembling one body. So much so that if any part of the body was sick or not well, then the whole body would share the sleeplessness and fever with it. You know what happens when you get sick? How you feel so bad? And maybe it's only one part of your body. Maybe your arm or your leg. Or maybe you have a toothache, something like that. But it's the same all over your whole body is ill. You can't find a place to escape from the pain in your body. If the tooth is hurting, your whole body's hurting. And pretty much that's what's being mentioned here. That the whole of the body of Muslims is like that. That when we have this faith in one God and worshiping Him alone, whoever else shares that faith with us is our brother. They're our brother in faith so much so that we're going to have this mercy and be merciful with each other's to the extent and the love that we have, it's like we're one body. So if we see somebody is suffering, that's our brother, our sister in Islam, then we're suffering with them and we want to do what? We want to remove that suffering. And we're praying for them. We're asking Allah, have mercy on this person, you know. And we're asking Allah also to cure them because it's as though we're suffering the same way. When we talk about treatment and mercy, we've talked about animal rights, human rights. I want to talk about neighbors' rights. Up to this point in the West, I have not seen any legislation in front of Parliament or Congress calling for neighbors' rights. I haven't really seen something like that as a bill. And if you hear about it, let us know. But right up to now, I'm not aware of it. But 1,400 years ago, there was a mandate that came with the revelation of Islam, which was Prophet Muhammad Islam, and listen to what he taught us. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the angel Gabriel continued to recommend me about treating neighbors kindly and politely, so much so that I thought he was going to order me to include them in my will as heirs to my estate. Let me repeat that for you and let you think about it. He said on the authority of Aisha, by the way, and she heard him say this, that the angel Gabriel had come to me and recommended to me to treat my neighbors kindly and politely. And he said it so much so that I thought he was going to order me to include them in my will and make them heirs to my estate. Mm. That means like your own personal family at that stage. So neighbors have a high status in Islam. Then the Prophet, peace be upon him, also said, By Allah, he doesn't believe. By Allah, 
He doesn't believe. By Allah, he is not a believer. So someone said to him, Who? You know, who are you talking about? And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, The person whose neighbor is not feeling safe from the evil of this man. That's an amazing statement. Let me read that to you again and think about it. Prophet Sallallahu here, he's saying three times, he's not a believer, he's not a believer, he's not a believer. And they said, who's not a believer? He said, he's not a believer that the neighbor doesn't feel safe from this man's evil. So this is real important for us to be sure that we're not treating our neighbors with any kind of evil. And then in another hadith, the teaching of Muhammad, peace be upon him, on the authority of Abu Huraira, he said that the messenger, peace be upon him, said, anybody who believes in Allah in the last day should not harm his neighbor, and anybody who believes in Allah in the last day should entertain his guests generously, and anybody who believes in Allah in the last day should say what is good or else keep quiet. This also is an amazing teaching in Islam. And I want to share with you a little story about this. I happen to know somebody personally who was a Muslim who moved to the United States. He was living in the Midwest in an apartment and he lived upstairs. He had a neighbor downstairs who didn't know anything about Islam, but he just hated Islam, hated the Muslims from things that he'd seen on television. And so based on this, he wanted to treat this man in a bad way. He was treating the Muslim really, really harsh. Whenever the man would go any place, this man would, you know, give him an evil look and, and do things to make him know that you're not welcome here. He even hollered at him things. But then something funny happened. The man was gone for a period of time. So much so that when the Muslim would pass by his doorstep, he noticed that the newspapers were piling up and also that the mail was falling out of his mailbox. So the Muslim began to pick up his mail and his papers, put them in a bag, and then he would keep it for him. And this continued for a period of time until the man returned. And when he returned, the Muslim knew because there wasn't any stuff laying there anymore, so he knocked on the door. The man opened the door, and the Muslim said, here's your stuff, here's your newspapers, magazines, and mail that accumulated while you were gone. The man was shocked. He said, you brought this for me? I mean, why? I, I, you know, we're not friends or anything. Why did you do this for me? He said, I didn't do it for you. I did it for my religion. I did it for Islam. Because this, this is something that Islam teaches us, that we must take care of our neighbors. And he mentioned some of these hadith, which I've been reading to you. The man was so shocked that he started to almost cry and he said, you know, I'm very sorry for the way I've been treating you. But I thought you were one of those Muslims. And he said, I am a Muslim. He said, but I mean, what I heard on TV or what I've heard in the radio and so on, this is not like you. And he said, well, I'm showing you this is what is this real Islam. So the man came to the Muslim and he said, I would like to know more about Islam. Where can I get information? So then the Muslim gave him a book to read about Islam, about Prophet Muhammad, and so on. So he began to do that. He began to read and study. And then one day he came to him and he said, You know what? Could I go to your church with you? And he means the mosque. <laughs> he didn't say he wanted to go with him to the church. You know, that, Others have said the same thing, by the way. So he said, Sure. And he took him. And the man was so astounded. He said, you know, I didn't know you Muslims were like this. I thought you guys were like terrorists and you're always plotting and planning and doing bad things. He said, this is amazing. It's different than I thought. The man started learning from the imam, the local representative or teacher in Islam there. And he slowly, slowly came around to understand that Islam is nothing that what he had been hearing in the media. The man was so overcome that he decided, you know what, I want to leave this way that I've been growing up in, and I want to be in this way that you guys are on. What do I need to do next? And then they showed him how to make his shahada. And he did. He entered into Islam. He said, Ashadu ila ilaha illallah wa ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Now that's enough right there to make me cry. Because when I hear these stories, even I've been there and seen it myself, hundreds, thousands of times I've seen shahadas, but I still get 
it still makes me cry and choke up because I remember when I entered in Islam and what it felt like, what it's like to leave the way of misguidance, what it's like to go away from this, this unfortunate circumstance that we call civilization and come to the truth of Islam and see this beautiful teaching, the rights that everybody has in Islam and this treatment of your neighbors. My God. It, it, but by the way, you know, it shouldn't be strange to the Muslims to hear this because there's another hadith of Muhammad Wasallam that teaches us that there was a person who used to leave trash. He left garbage on the doorstep of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So much so that every time when the Prophet went out, he, he had to clean, clean it to be able to leave his house. But then one morning when he came out, it wasn't there. And so the private peace be upon him went to this man's house, his neighbor. He went to his house. He knocked the door. He found the man was sick. The man couldn't get up. So he went in to take care of him and see what do you need. And he said, don't you know that I'm the one who's been putting this garbage on your doorstep? He said, yes, I know that. He said, well then, why are you here? He said, because I didn't see the garbage. So I assume something must have happened to you. There must have been some kind of problem. And so that's why he went to the man to see what's going on with him. And you know what? The man said, The same way. This man entered into Islam based on this good treatment and realizing what is the real Islam. Islam is not by reading a book. It's not by reciting something over and over. But it's in the character of the person. And this is what we're talking about in these programs, is the development of the Muslim character. If the people in the world today would see what I've seen and the beauty of the Muslims in their character, the way they treat each other, the way they help each other, the way that they work as one family, as one unit, so much so that if one is sick, then they all feel it. Just like if the body is having a sickness, then the whole body feels it. If people see this, then they could also work on their character and get closer to this beautiful teaching. You've been watching The Way of Islam, the development of the Muslim character. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.